So I had a debate with a transgender activist named Kathleen Tanner. Uh, it was a virtual debate. It was hosted by a Catholic organization, and they wanted, um, they originally asked me to have a God debate, but I really don't want to do God debates anymore. Um, so I said, let's talk about current events, let's talk about issues, let's talk about politics, let's talk about wokeism. And then they proposed a debate with uh, a, a transgender activist named Kathleen Tanner. Um, uh, and uh, we had a debate. And I was coming into this ready because, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get progressives to debate you um, because they believe that debating is actually harmful because words are violent, uh, which is... I can get into that, but that's not the point. So it's hard to get a, 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 a progressive activist to debate you. Uh, and this was an activist who was going to take the pro that Me Too had not gone too far, and I took the con. Or I should, I should, I took the position that Me Too had gone too far, and she took the position that it hadn't. And you know, I went in there with um, ready. I got uh, Pete Bogosian's book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. You're going to be, he's going to be on the show. Uh, on the soon. He's going to be on soon. Um, and I read it, I talked to Pete about it, and he gave me some pointers, you know, you're going to go up against somebody who, uh, you know, I was prepared for a stereotype, um, but that's not what I got. Uh, Kathleen was very reasonable. We had a good civil discussion, and we found common ground, and it was a productive debate, and I'm really excited about it. I'm really happy with how it went. Um, I think uh, both sides won because we found some common ground. I think it was a very uh, uh, good debate. Um, I'm going to, uh, I don't know if what I'm going to do about the questions at the end, but I'm not going to edit the, um, the video at all. I reserve the right to cut in every once in a while to inject some comments. Um, because here's what happened. I went in ready to be, have a, have a civil conversation, and we did have a civil conversation, but um, I found out that I still have many buttons that get pushed, and I got uh, a little more emotional than I wanted to get. Um, you know, I have uh, fine. Just to tell me that I'm fine, as you will see in this, uh, is it kind of sets me off. It's like my version of the N-word, telling me or any violation victim that they're fine because they're moving on with life is a real slap in the face, in my opinion. And I. Uh, I kind of um, drilled that point home, maybe a little too hard in this, but uh, I think what came out of this is a positive exchange. I'm really uh, grateful to Kathleen for the exchange. Uh, her links are in the description of this. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. I hope this turns out well, and I hope to see lots of comments and uh, hear your opinions. You know, I, I do have some evolving opinions here, and I may be wrong in something that I say, so I want to hear about it in the comments section. Help me learn. It's called civil discourse. David, this is about the Me Too movement. It's collateral damages. Let's hear your five-minute opening statement. We're ready to go. Go. We're ready to go. Well, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for having me on the show. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's a pretty big um, mm -hmm. detail, that, pretty big deal that we're talking about the Me Too movement here in 2020 and in the in the face of this pandemic. Uh, I hope it brings everything into perspective. You know, I was um, uh, uh, an activist for 24 years mm -hmm. and uh, I got myself up the ladder and I worked really hard. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I worked really hard to... Um, to be a voice for feminism in the atheist movement. And I, I think I did very well in, in, in doing my things. But what happened to me was that um, I had some sexual experiences with some people, but two women uh, lied and used those lies for personal gain. And it completely enthralled me at first. It completely flew me at first because women aren't supposed to lie about sexual assault uh, for personal gain, but they did. Um, and when I was, uh, when I, when they made those lies, I was fired, um, with no due process. So I wasn't given the chance to post my side at all. My eyewitnesses who included two board members, um, my, uh, pictures, my recordings, all that stuff. It, it would it never saw the light of day and it didn't see the light of day until after I was fired. And then when it did see the light of day, I was rehired. And then another woman lied again and said that a touch on her back was sexual assault. Now, I have gone from a 
complete Me Too proponent to a complete Me Too opponent because of the behavior. And what I have realized is that Me Too is a movement that is based completely on mantra. It is a movement based completely, uh, completely devoid of numbers, completely devoid of objectives, completely devoid of what we want to accomplish with this movement. There are some vague ideas that we want women to come out more when they're sexually assaulted, but we have no numbers about how many women aren't coming out about sexually assaulted or that we have any sort of effect on that by taking down men who are otherwise innocent. And that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. We have a collateral damage going on. We have women who can and will lie about sexual assault for personal gain. It happened to me three times. It's also happened very clearly to Johnny Depp and other people. And mm -hmm. what we have is this movement, this leftover feminism movement, which mm -hmm. cannot admit that women can be liars, cannot admit that women can be terrible and cannot admit that even if you're a straight white guy, you might not be guilty of committing any crimes. And if you are guilty of committing some crimes, you shouldn't be thrown out because some people say that you committed more crimes than you did without any sort of evidence. And what we have seen is this, this, this division, this terrible ejection of men from, from their places. Myself is only one example uh, um, and done so with, with vigor and with uh, ferocity from this crowd that says that it's being done on behalf of women who are, are unable to come out on their own without having any data to back them up. And so when I look at myself as collateral damage for this movement, I say, well, if I'm going to be collateral damage for the movement, at least the movement is doing something positive. And at this point now, We've been having this for two years. What positive has happened? What has happened? What is positive? Well, some people have gotten thrown out. Some bad guys have gotten thrown out, and that's good. But some bad women have also lied and taken down some good men using the false mantra that women can't lie about sexual assault. Me Too is dangerous to women. It infantilizes women. It takes away our skepticism, it takes away due process, which is something that we must hold dear. It does not have any sort of basis in proof that it is actually doing anything at all or that there is even a problem in the first place. We don't know. And so when we say, oh, well, this is fine because it's so important, and yet we have absolutely no numbers to back that up, well, we don't have a movement that's actually about helping the victims. What we have is a movement that's actually geared toward revenge. And that's what we're seeing here. That's the kangaroo court. That's the, 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 the mob mentality that we're seeing here. It's not about justice anymore. It was once upon a time. And it should be, again, I think Me Too was a good idea to start with. But what happened now, it's just not, it's, it's, it's not skepticism. It's not justice. And it's not even good for women. And that's why the Me Too movement has gone too far. It has gone past the I'm going to get bad guys out into the I'm going to use male guilt and the lie that women can't lie in order to allow women to just take down guys they don't like and ruin their lives without due process and without mercy. And that's why Me Too has gone too far. Thank you, David. Kathleen, uh, your five-minute opening statement, please. Okay, so I want to go ahead and apologize if, like, I accidentally, like, drop for some reason. My internet just has been going wild. Um, anyway, um, Dave, I'd like to thank you for agreeing to come here. Um, it's awesome that you agreed to come and discuss this topic with us because I think it is um, an extremely important social justice movement. Um, maybe at least in my lifetime, the most important social justice movement. And I think it has uh, implications that go far and beyond Twitter posts and, and news stories. And I believe at least in order to have this discussion, we first have to truly define what it is that the Me Too movement is, its founding, its goals, and what the people who are a part of this want for the future. 
And to ask, has this movement gone too far, uh, we must know what it is that they are, first of all, trying to achieve. Uh, Me Too was started in 2006 by Tanara Burke, who is an African-American uh, uh, activist and sexual assault survivor. And she began a discussion with Black women and young girls about the prominence of sexual violence within the Black community. Uh, the movement didn't really take off or become a movement or really have any kind of national attention until 2017, uh, when Alyssa Milano and uh, several other celebrity feminists began using the tag on uh, Twitter, hashtag MeToo. Um, the MeToo movement is multi-purpose activism. Its first goal, and probably what I believe is its most important goal, goal at least early on, was solidarity. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with anything other than to give women the ability to cope with one another by saying, you're not alone, this happened to me. Um, and of course, we can uh, expand that more broadly into anybody that has been a victim of sexual assault as you are not alone, uh, this happened to me too. Um, and when we are not alone, um, it's not as big of a problem necessarily. It becomes easier to deal with, especially if we know that someone somewhere has survived. Uh, the second goal is to give a sense of magnitude to the issues of sexual violence. Now, we know um, historically that crime rates have been dropping, at least in Western civilizations, um, America, Europe, Canada, um, that the crime rates have been going down across the board. But when we think about sexual assault, when we think about domestic violence, when we think about really any kind of crime, we cannot insulate ourselves to merely the Western world. We have to think of the entire uh, globe as a whole. So when we think about Me Too in its instantiation as an American social justice thing, we now expand that out globally to a global um, a social justice movement. In a world where we have seen leaps forward in areas of civil rights in the West, we have done precious little to address how sexual violence still uh, shapes every aspect of our society, not only in America, <clears throat> but the entire world. The World Health Organization estimates that one third of all women worldwide are personally affected by sexual violence. Um, uh, this bringing forward a conversation about what sexual violence is, its scope, and to help those have suffered in silence for far too long to heal and attempt to finally address and end the plague that is sexual. So these are the goals that I think um, I will be at least attempting to frame my conversation around. Um, and of course, if anything needs to be added, I'm certainly uh, open to that. So I think in, in closing, I think what we have to ask ourselves is, ha you know, the question is, have this movement gone too far? Well, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean for something to go too far? Too far carries a perceived negative connotation, understood, I believe, to say that this thing has had unintended or intended consequences that have negatively affected society at large and the individual. Uh, is there a witch hunt by men, uh, by radical feminists, to term to overthrow the patriarchy? This seems a little far-fetched to me. Uh, are there people who have been falsely accused of sexual impropriety and have had their lives? irreversibly affected? Possibly. Has sexual violence been an issue for longer than our history books go back? That's unequivocally a yes. So if the question is, has me gone too far? I believe the answer is it hasn't gone far enough. Um, and that is the conclusion of um, how I think I will be framing, at least from my, from my conversation. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, there was slight mic issues, though I was able to hear uh, everything. Dave, can you confirm that you heard uh, Kathleen's opening statement well? Yeah, I heard her. Okay. Yeah. So now we're going to the next segment, which will be open conversations between you two for 30 to 35 minutes. Dave, uh, you begin, please. So, Kathleen, that was a good opening, and one of the really one of the things that I, I, I want to start off on the, on the bat here is that you and I are both good people, and we're both trying to do good things and, and get the world to a place, and I think that if we were to look at the place that you were trying to get the world to and a place that I was trying to get the world to, I think they'd be pretty similar worlds. Uh, I think we're just disagreeing on, um, you know, they'd be worlds with, without prejudice, without bigotry, without violence, without hate, um, and without unnecessary jailing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I must say, I, I got to take the only thing that you said that I take issue with um, was the the way you kind of tossed out, oh, might some guys lives be ruined? Maybe. 
It's definitely happening. It happened to me and it's happening all over the place. And, and, and we have to admit, uh, as uh, I'm the second wave feminist, I've been a feminist person since, since I, I was a kid. And, and, and we have to admit where, where something isn't quite right. This, um, this idea that, um, <clears throat> This idea, uh, how do I say this right? I, I think it's just um, the idea that we have these objectives for this movement. You are not alone. Uh, to tell the women that you, they are not alone. You, these are your objectives. And to give some sense of magnitude of the violence against women. And your magnifying the, magna the violence against women by far if you're not applying any sort of due process. And if you're not saying, hey, these guys' lives are being ruined, you're magnifying the damage artificially and you're still not doing it with any numbers. Wouldn't it be much more effective to our common goal of making sure that women are not feeling alone, our common goal of giving a true <coughs> sense of the magnitude of violence, wouldn't that encompass numbers? Wouldn't that encompass something beyond, we just got to keep doing this forever and not pay attention to the damage that we're causing to real human beings? Human beings like, you know, I have to say, like myself, who's been fighting on our side for so long. Don't so, you think it's important that we recognize the damage that it's causing? Well, so I think I mean there's a couple there's a couple ways that I could address that. Um, I think the first thing is the first distinction that we obviously need to make is that there is a difference between what happens in a court of law versus what happens in uh, a private business. Um, the way in which a private business purports to operate itself in the public sphere um, does not have anything to do with the way that we would prosecute a crime. So. If a private company feels that a person has done something that mars their reputation, that may prevent them from uh, doing business as they choose to do, they are well within their rights to remove that person from um, their company. And then doesn't really need to be any, you know, uh, charges filed in, in a court of law. So that's one thing we have. But the man's do. life is still ruined, but the man's life is still ruined and he didn't get any sort of due process. It may be the legal right of the company to do that, but is it moral? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily want to get into normative statements quite yet because morality can be a twitchy thing and we could end up having the whole conversation about that. But I would say um, when we talk about um, someone's lives being ruined, right? You know, when we think about that, um, I can only think of one person, and I'm going to include you, you in this, whose lives have been unequivocally ruined by the Me Too, and that's going to be Harvey Weinstein, who's now doing 23 years in prison for um, being convicted of two counts of actual criminal. I lost everything, and, and i got to say, Kathleen, um, that's a really terrible thing to say to a victim. It's a really terrible thing for you to say to me that, oh, I just got to say that I don't think your life has been ruined. Dude, I lost everything in my life. I lost my career, my wife, my family, my friends, my reputation. I lost everything because women lied, not because I did something and got caught, but because women lied. One of the women brought me to a party as her friend, and when I touched her on the back to see if there was anything I could do to help her, she filed a police report and called it sexual assault and made such a fuss that I got fired because the company who had, well, I had to leave. That's not moral, and yes, we are going to go there because I am saying that this argument is immoral. Me Too is immoral, and that saying, oh, we're not going to talk about the morality of hurting people's lives without due process, that's an immoral statement, Kathleen. We have to talk about the morality of Me Too. It is well, immoral. People are getting hurt. Well, again, I don't. It's, it's not that I don't mind talking about the normativity. Right, it's just that I don't want to dive right into it. When I said I'm going to include in that, I don't, I don't want to um, think that I don't want you to think that I am lessening the impact of things that you've gone through. But when I think about a life being ruined, right, um, I think about someone 
who has no capacity whatsoever to lift themselves back up. Now, as I understand it, and I, and, and I don't really want to get into too much personal stuff with you um, uh, about your, uh, I mean, I understand it's important, it's important to you, but as to the general conversation about the broader Me Too movement, you have been rehired, as I understand it, um, as the executive director for Atheist International Alliance. Is that correct? Oh, that, that did happen. And then the woman made the false Me Too allegation that said touching her on the back was sexual assault. And then I had to leave that too. Is that okay? Is that moral? The reason I was rehired was because the first one was so obviously false that I got rehired against the whole Me Too push. But then mm-hmm. that resulted in a hunt for me, Kathleen. They hunted okay, me. Let me ask that- you this. Do you agree that the criminal justice system has made mistakes in the past? Of course. It's a flawed system. But at so, least everybody process. But we wouldn't say that the criminal justice system has gone too far if it gets something wrong. We recognize that all systems, all movements, be it from the earliest instantiation of America to where we are now from trying to get black people uh, recognized as human beings and the right to vote, women the right to vote, the civil rights movement, and so on and so forth, that there were mistakes along the way, and those mistakes indirectly or directly can cause people harm. But we don't say that those movements failed simply because there were mistakes made. We well, recognize don't know. and agree with the mistakes that were made, and, and absolutely, I agree with you that generally speaking, and you said you wanted to talk about numbers, it is just true that women typically do not lie about sexual assault. But what one does, one does and, and we don't have live no in a world where that. That's an assumption. You have no numbers for that at all. That's my point. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree, disagree with that. I, I believe that the numbers are of assumptions. Well, I'm going to disagree with that. I believe that there are numbers provided by RAIN and the World Health Organization and the National Center Against Domestic Violence, the National Center Against uh, Child Violence, and the Mastic, uh, National Center there Against Sexual There are no numbers against, for, about false allegations. There are zero numbers. What there are is one set of numbers that says 2 to 10% of rape allegation p- police reports are false. And people are saying, oh, let's take that 2 to 10%, make it 2%, and just expand it over, oh, I don't know, anonymous reports to BuzzFeed and say that that's a 2% chance. That's the only number we have, and it's completely bogus that we as a movement are using them. The fact is we don't have numbers. The fact is that this presumption that you make that women are so oppressed has zero numbers behind it. And the idea that we are doing anything at all has zero numbers behind it. We are killing people's lives here and not paying attention to the repercussions and trying to pretend that we're actually doing something when we have no way to tell if we're doing anything right. And we have people like you, Kathleen, I'm sure you're a very nice person, but for you to say that only one person who's been ever ruined by this is, is, is some, is a, is a rapist. No, I lost everything I cared about. Yeah. I can find another job. And yes, you know what? There's a lot of women that you know, that have been raped. They've been raped hard and it's been terrible for them. But they've got other jobs, right? They got other jobs. They get they're fine, right? But you don't say that to them because it's a terrible thing to take a violation like this and minimize it down to, oh, I don't think we should even count you as, as a significant factor. Kathy, you've got no numbers. And you've got a mantra that is built on taking away due process, which is there, and it was there in all those other movements for the purpose of progress. This is anti-progress. This is going to stop people from, from getting along. This is going to make fear. This is, it's making fear. I mean, it's making fear. Men are, high, are, are afraid to hire women now. That's true. That's true. It's well, asinine. It's asinine. I think, Go ahead. I think that, I mean, that, I mean, I'm not trying to discredit your personal experience. I mean, that was very emotionally charged. Um, I'm sorry. No, no, and and it's fine. Look, I I understand that these things can run emotional. I'm I'm only and ever interested in what 
you know, I believe to be the facts of the matter. Um, the facts are that we know worldwide uh, at least one in five women will be raped at some point in time in their life. Um, um, but and Kathy, I'm going gonna, gonna to interrupt you there, okay? Because you're using worldwide, and that includes Africa. And there's a lot of rape in Africa, and there's a lot of sexual assault in Africa. And when you're using numbers from RAIN, like one out of three women worldwide are personally affected by sexual assault, well, sexual assault can be a, a pat on the ass on the train, or it can be rape. And personally affected can be I was pinned down and raped in a, in a, in a train station, or my friend was patted on the ass. That's a really broad statement. And when you're saying I'm going to use global numbers because you know USA numbers – show a decrease in everything across the board, which you've already admitted, you are, again, trying to make uh, an issue out of something that I think is not really an issue. I think you should stick to U.S. numbers because you're, you're really skewing your numbers when you bring in Africa. Well, as a person who was born and raised in Africa, I can tell you that Africa gets a bad rap. It's not nearly as bad as, um, you know, it, Africa is not a third world, you know, an entirely third world area. There are third world areas in it, but I can tell you uh, from personally living there that there's not much difference between South Sudan and inner city Detroit. Um, yeah, but if you're bringing in the Muslim world, rape, rape, rape and sexual assault are, are, are part and parcel of the Muslim world. So if you if you're looking at our, if you're looking at Northern Africa, if you're looking at the Middle East, you're talking about skewing your numbers dramatically, and, and it's 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 affecting your 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 argument. So I just wanted to raise awareness of that. When you say things like one in five and one in three worldwide, that's not here, and that's not okay. that's not what you're helping. You isn't helping that at all. Well, so that's, I'm I'm sorry, David, but uh, but again, that's just a minimization. Right? I don't care where it is. Right. The fact that, first of all, let's just let's just for my sake define what it is that assault is. Right. So I I understand assault to be um, any kind of touching, be it innocent or otherwise, that is unwanted. Um, that would be considered assault. Um, as far as you know, the other part of that, we would have to talk about consent. Um, when we put our hand on someone's shoulders, do I think that that should be considered an assault? No, of course not. Um, well, that's what that, I have really charged against me now. That, but if that person then says, "Please don't do that," um, that is understood that you do not have consent to uh, touch that person's body. But that's the that's the black and white uh, area. And I know we don't like to operate in the gray, but with this kind of almost with anything, we have to operate in the gray. What happens when the woman? is touched by a person, or a man is touched by a man who's of higher position, and they know that speaking out could negatively affect them. And so instead of attempting to communicate vocally that they don't want this, they try to use nonverbal. Now, you've given a lot of personal examples, so I will give a personal example of mine, um, an acquaintance of acquaintance that... Um, I, I used to hang out with, used to like to try to grab my hand and hold my hand. And I was fairly scared of that person. Um, they, they weren't quite right in the head, and, and I didn't want them to lash out at me. So I would try to uh, you know, give these nonverbal cues. Don't touch me. But it was never enough. Um, but the reason that I didn't vocalize it was I was scared. I didn't, I didn't want this person to lash out at me or anything like that. Um, and, I, and I think that happens a lot. I think that we forget that it has only been maybe within the last 30 years that women have really felt anywhere in the world, much less in Western countries, that they've had any real power over their destiny. We seem to forget that. We seem to want to minimize the effects of history. There's always this idea that um, we need to study history because if we don't study history, then we'll repeat the same mistakes that we're doing over and over again. But when we do study history and we see things that we don't like, we tend to minimize that. Oh, that's not bad. Discrimination and racism and segregation in the country didn't end until like 50, 60 years ago. The idea that women should hold positions of power is still one of the is still one of the most extremely unpopular opinions uh, in this country. 
there are large, large, large majorities of men that don't think women should be in position of power. So when we talk about sexual assault, sexual violence, and things like that, there's automatically going to be a negative connotation against those people. And we have to take all that into consideration when we deal with this Me Too movement. Again, whose goal was, first and foremost, solidarity. When someone takes, this is what I will grant you, Dave, people can take a movement and pervert it to meet their own goals. All their feminists that just want to tear down men absolutely, and they're disgusting, right? They are absolutely disgusting creatures. And do they exist? And will they use the Me Too movement to perpetrate their goals? Absolutely, I'll give you that. But do you think, Dave, that that is the majority, the large majority of women? No, I don't think you do. I no, know. Kathleen, we don't have any numbers. We don't have any numbers. That's my whole point. Yes, we do know that some, and thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to you uh, in, in, that, in that tone, which I kind of interrupted. But yeah, you're absolutely right. We have to live in the gray. And yeah, you're absolutely right. There are women who will use this system and pervert it to themselves. And yeah, you're right. Me Too was at least important to, to give that unity in the first place. But my point is that I don't think that the numbers that are, are being remotely affected and nobody's looking at the numbers. And so when we look at how this is being done, we're, we've lost our humanism here. Nobody is looking, nobody is caring about the men who are being destroyed and nobody is caring about the efficacy of this program, of this idea, uh, of the idea that, oh, you know, we can stay, yeah, sure, companies have the right to fire people. Uh, but the cancel culture, the Me Too culture, the whole idea that if a woman says something, the man is guilty. Well, come on, Kathy. You, you, you just admitted to me that women lie and use this and pervert it. You must admit to me then that Me Too must come with due process then, does it not? Well, so um, let, me, let me ask you two questions in response to that. How long has cancel culture been a thing in your mind? Uh, say 2014, 2014, 2015, 2014. Okay, so six years. How long has cancel coat culture, as far as women speaking up for themselves, benefit? As soon as the Me Too movement came out. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. How many times have women been blacklisted for speaking out against? powerful men how many Ooh, times I, have women I lost don't know how many dollars and, and well let, let's just look we don't how many say, numbers you got numbers tell me numbers oh, i want numbers tell me numbers oh hold on dave hold on dave we're not so this isn't like a like a, i'm going to show you my sources you're going to show me your sources kind of thing this is just me and you talking right and so okay. we're going to have to use a little bit of our intuition you strike me as an extremely intelligent person so i'm going to assume that you can uh, conceive of situations in which historically women have been punished for speaking out. Now, we know based on the celebrity culture that uh, celebrities have come out and talked about their blacklisting because of Harvey Weinstein and some of these other people. And those are just anecdotes, right? We don't like to go on anecdotes, but they give a, a, a picture. If a woman like Ashley Judd can be blacklisted, if a woman like uh, Alyssa Milano can be blacklisted for speaking out, then we have to assume that only for five years has this been something that's going on for men. It's been going on for women forever. This is not new to women. This is only new to men. And by the way, one of my favorite celebrities of all time was affected by this. Johnny Depp was accused of some pretty horrible shit by Amber Heard. And he yeah. lost the ability to be in Pirates of the Caribbean. And I was really disappointed. I cut turns. Amber Heard may possibly have lied. Johnny Depp, hey, got, his, Johnny Depp got his gig there. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. She definitely lied. She's definitely the bad guy here. Well, so. She's but definitely wait a the bad guy. Yeah, but wait a second. When, when it was found out that she lied, we have a process to deal with that. You keep talking about due process. If a woman lies about sexual assault, 
you are free to avail yourself to the full extent of our court system from civil. I'm gonna swear now. I'm gonna swear now because because that's bull. Because that's bull. Because I already lost everything. I already lost everything. You're telling a rape victim that she could m- file a civil suit against her rapist. That's not a thing. I can't. Hey, now, I, I, what am I going to do? Sue the people who lied? Sue the people who lied? No, I don't wait have recourse. Wait a second. Now you have some common ground. Now you understand, right? See, I'm not trying to. Dave, I'm not trying to minimize your situation, right? I don't know. I I refuse. In, in preparing for this debate, I refuse to look up any information on your particular situation because I did not want it to color my judgment in any way, shape, or form. And I did that specifically so that I would not form an opinion, positive or negative, otherwise, about you, right? People spoke to me that knew you um, because I am a member of the atheist communities. Uh, there are people that know you. And for the most part, what I heard is Dave is a great guy. That's pretty much what I heard. But I don't want to minimize your situation because I don't know much about your situation. I wasn't there, so I can't really comment on it. I'm going to believe that what you are saying is true because that's how I operate, right? I'm going to believe that what you are saying is true, right? Now, whether it is or not, I don't know because I wasn't there. So I can provide you with empathy. I can say, yeah, you know, what? this sucks. This guy, he lost his job twice. Um, these, these, these two women... But I'm using your situation to kind of flip it because this isn't a conversation about your situation. This is a comment about a social justice movement that has the capacity to do tremendous good, not only for people in the United States, but people all over the world. Because we know that while the United States has a very bad track record with sexual assault, as you pointed out, Africa oh, no. has a horrible track record with it. China, the Middle East, and these places will not get any better until the United States and Europe shine a spotlight on it. And how do we do that? For social? How do we, and how does not giving women and men and accusations, how does elevating sexual assault cases above due process and just saying, okay, uh, she said it, he's guilty, how does that help stop? women from getting raped in Asia. Well, let me ask you something. What do you think should be done? Because you you lost your job um, and, and, you know, Johnny Depp lost his job. You know, uh, Louis C.K. lost his job, although Louis C.K. is now doing his job again. Um, the senator from Minnesota is thinking about running again. Johnny Depp got his job back again. So with the exception of you, I can't. Tens of millions of dollars. Don't do that. Don't do that, Kathleen. Don't do that. Johnny Depp went through a whole lot of shit and a whole lot of gr- horrible feelings, and so did I. This has been a terrible experience. Don't dismiss this with saying, I'm oh, well, we- Huh. Don't say that. I'm not, dismissing, I'm not dismissing your experience in any way, no, shape, form. No, no, what no, I'm no, saying no, is, no, oh, we're going to get our jobs back, so it's okay. When you do that, you're just like, I just want you to hear yourself saying, oh, that rape victim, she's fine. She got her job back. She's walking around. She's she's happy. Look at her. Look at that rape victim laughing. That rape victim is laughing. Right, she's but, fine. No, don't right, do that. We it's have wrong. To understand, we have to understand these statements, Dave in context of the broader conversation we're having. The conversation that we're having is, has Me Too gone too far, right? So Me Too isn't about David, Me Too going too far isn't just about Dave Silverman. It's not a vacuum, right? It's about about every people. Right, it's about all all women who have been affected by sexual violence. It's about all men who have been affected by sexual violence. I can't get my job back. I can't be unviolated. Women can't be unraped. It is a permanent thing. It is an attack. Well, see, that's, well but see, that's where I'm going to disagree with you. You can. You cannot get a job back at atheists, uh, uh, American atheists, or maybe you can't get a job back at Atheist International Alliance. Though so I would assume that, you know, uh, generally speaking, we understand atheists to be rational and empirical people as opposed to the other side of the aisle who believe in fairies, um, that, you know, if evidence is presented in a court of law, that they would heed to that. But I want to know from you, what what should private companies do? If, if a woman accuses someone or a man accuses someone of sexual impropriety, what do you want that company to do? 
because they don't have they don't know how to do the law. They can't subpoena people. They can't they can't force testimony. They can't do anything. So what exactly would you like them to do? Well, you see, that's the thing. That's why Me Too is so toxic, because companies really don't have a choice. They have no choice to fight against this. They have to fire us. And, and that's why I left AAI. That's why AA fired me. They have to because you can't fight against this mob because this mob doesn't care about truth or justice. They care about lynching. And that's the point. What, what would I do? You asked me what would I do. You've asked me a couple of times. The first thing that I would do, Kathy, is go back to what you said at the beginning uh, of this thing uh, to get people, to get women to understand that they are not alone. Well, one way to do that is with an advertising campaign uh, to give some sense of the magnitude of violence. Well, one way to do that is with some quantitative research to give us the numbers to actually do things and to actually track things. One thing that we should be doing, the one thing that we should be doing is admitting the fact that the Me Too time is over. Everybody knows what the problem is, and it's now just becoming a, oh, let's get the men back for all the things that they did to uh, women some time ago. Well, I didn't hurt any women. And I didn't pay any penalty, and neither did Johnny Depp. But I, I did pay the penalty, and so did Johnny Depp, even though we didn't do the crimes, and so did so many others. And I, I think what we should do is realize that a crime is a crime. A crime is a crime. If you get raped, if you get robbed, if you get uh, attacked, if you get cheated, report it to the police. Let them do their due process. Do not do the cancel culture of trying to get the person fired because that's not due process. That's not fair. And I'll tell you very clearly, it is not moral. People are losing their, their livelihoods here by the, by the hundreds of thousands, I would bet. And I have no numbers for that because nobody's doing the numbers. But what we have to stop doing is treating sexual assault as if it's some sort of a special thing above and beyond all these other crimes. You got a complaint? Go to the cops. Present your evidence. If you got no evidence, the guy goes free. That's the truth. That's the fact. And it should be the guy goes free, but also the woman goes free. If you're a, if you're a guy and you get sexually harassed by a woman, you got to make a complaint to the cops. You got to bring your evidence and you got to take that woman down or she will go free. We have to understand that, that the abuse comes in all directions, goes in all directions. It is all bad. And crimes are crimes. The reason we have our criminal justice system is to investigate these crimes and there is nothing out there, and I mean nothing out there, because I have looked, there is nothing out there that supports the assertion that women are coming out and, and, and reporting these cases and being turned away by the police or the authorities. That's not a real thing. We just have to publicize that. We don't have to take down people. We don't have to hurt human, human humanity. We don't have to cause division. We just have to publicize that women can come out. And then we have to publicize how bad the numbers really are. Let's do the work instead of just destroying lives, Kathleen. So I'm going to just hammer home on this point again, and I, 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 I know it may seem puerile, but we know who Emmett Till is. You know who Emmett Till is, correct? Yeah. Okay, so Emmett Till was obviously innocent. Um, how many innocent people have we executed in the course of American history? Lots. Not in comparison to the number of people we got wrong, but we have executed a lot of people who were innocent. We've jailed people who are innocent. We would not say that the criminal justice system has failed in its pursuit of justice. We would just acknowledge that the criminal justice system is run by people who make mistakes. Will the Me Too movement make mistakes? Yes. And when they make mistakes, we should absolutely show those mistakes and make sure that they are not repeated. But that is not critique of the overall. When you talk about numbers, Dave, we know that women historically will stay in abusive relationships because they don't have anywhere else to go and because their abusers will make them think that they are worthless. We know this. I know you know that. Yes, so we do know that. Too. Men will do. John Depp shows that. Men will sometimes stay in abusive relationships and they don't come forward and yet they are assaulted. Children do not 
come forward all the time when they are abused. And women in the business community who are just now finally getting their legs up underneath them don't typically come forward for fear of losing their job, for fear of having their reputation destroyed, and because they do not that in a majority of places with the criminal justice system that is so overclogged, underfunded, and understaffed that it can take years for these claims to process through. And in the meantime, they have to sit there and they have to work with these people. If, you know, except for maybe the radical feminists who want to tear down the patriarchy would believe that. But I also don't think that you think that overall women are out to get men. No, not overall, not overall, absolutely not overall. But you have to understand how scary it is from my perspective. I mean, I it, it's it's so it's so profoundly toxic, Kathleen. I mean, I've been I've been an activist for twenty five years, and one of the things that I've been building in that time is this sense of unity, this 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 appreciation for the sense of, of unity as as a as a force together. But when we're talking about what Me Too has done um, to relationships between men and women, and it's you're right, it's absolutely positively a minority of women, a, 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 a large minority, I should say. A small minority of women. Um, yeah, so let's concentrate a lot of people. On, on that small my, And uh, Canadians messaging me to wrap this up so we can get to the next sec segment. Um, but like, I what I don't want to do, like what I, what I want to to kind of hammer home. Maybe we can walk. Through. I don't blame me too for the few radical people. I don't blame Bernie Sanders for Bernie Bros. Right. I don't blame Donald Trump for insane communists on the left. Right. I don't blame any position for the radical elements. I look at what the movement overall is or what the thing overall is. And I ask myself, what is it and has it succeeded? What are the unintended and intended consequences? The intended consequences of me too to say just that. Me too. And in that it has succeeded. And then we can talk about the radical crazy people. We can deal with them. But that we, we need to stop associating that with me too. What we can't do is allow – what we do historically, and it's happened with a lot of movements, is allow these crazy people, these radicals, to take over movement. It happened with um, a March on Wall Street. Right, it happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, with the Antifa and stuff. We keep allowing these crazy people and the news media to take our discussion away from us. Racism is a problem in America, and we cannot have a discussion unless we can talk about it honestly. Sexual assault is a problem in America, and we can't have a conversation about it unless we can talk about it honestly. Homophobia, transphobia, and on and on and on. We cannot have conversations. If we continue to latch on to these crazy, unhinged people. So I can't I can't disagree with almost anything you just said. I think you and I are on this exact same page on all that stuff. The, 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 the problem that I have is that I believe that Me Too has lost its humanism and is is running because because I'm, I'm a numbers guy and there are no numbers. And so I envision Me Too. Uh, it has no numbers. It has um, critical mass, and it has um, no method for mercy, forgiveness, or redemption. And it has no due process, which is a stabilizing force. So it has no stabilizing forces, and it is going fast and fast. And 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 what it's doing is it's making um, it, it's creating this rift. It, it's 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 setting back male and ma men and women relationships. I'm I'm sure of it. Because I mean, I've never been afraid of women before. Um, but well, uh, I, I hope. I mean, look, I, I have empathy for you. Right? Like I said, I, I didn't have any. I, I purposely didn't do anything. I'm gonna tell you, I believe you, right? I'm so gonna. Can uh, I make I'm a point? Though? That, yeah, go ahead. Could, can I make? I, I just want to interrupt you and make a point because I don't want to forget it. Um, because I think this is the most important point that I'm going to make, and it goes in direct contrast to what you just said. It is about me too, and I can tell you why it's about me too, and not a few crazies. 
And the reason this is my, the reason that my problems with Me Too are about Me Too and not just a few crazies who ignore it is that feminism, by and large, doesn't do what you say it should do and prosecute or even care about abuse. The fact that Me Too, that the fact that um, the, there, there was, there's, there's been absolutely almost a complete um, silence from the feminist movement, from anyone in the feminists. When I, I published the, the audio tape of the um, of one of the, of the accuser that said that touching her back once was sexual assault, and that could be the work of one crazy person, or one bad person. The problem is that she brought a whole bunch of feminist leaders with her, and they took her side. That right. is the problem. It's not I that agree, I agree with that. I'll grant you that. And, and I think, excuse, excuse I, me, I'll, I'll have to cut in. Ka Kathleen, I'll have to cut in. So <clears throat> this se segment uh, has around two minutes remaining, and we really have to be moving towards audience questions. People are burning with questions. Uh, there's That's fine. Some, yeah. I've got one more thing I'm going to say, and then we'll turn it over to you. Um, I, I think right. I'll, I'll leave <coughs> this section with this guy. Um, first, of all, I really appreciate you coming in and talking, talking to me with this because, uh, like, I mean, I tend to be a fairly conservative person, but in this area, I kind of feel like we need to explore this more. But what I will do is, is that what the Me Too movement does seem to be lacking is accountability. And so I will grant you that 100% that we do need accountability. Um, and that's where I'll, I'll, I will leave. And, and I'll just... Uh... Because I had the first thing to say, I don't want to have the last words. I just want to thank you for coming on. Um, and and uh, I, I've also enjoyed this conversation. And I can't agree with you more that we, my side and your side, two sides of good people trying to do the right thing for the world, need to talk more, need to have more civil discourse because I could be wrong, you could be wrong. And the only way I'm going to find out if I'm wrong is if we get schooled in the conversation. Absolutely. All, all right. right. All, all right. So, uh, Dave, before we move on to the questions, you were the new guest here. I ask this of all the guests. Did you enjoy your experience on the show? Oh, yeah. Kathy, Kathleen is great. Um, I, I had a very good conversation with her, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun you know, watching awesome. this. Awesome. All of that. So now the next segment, Dave, um, people will be asking questions. If anything makes you uncomfortable or you don't want to continue the line of inquiry, simply say so, okay? It's for both sides, simply say so. And we start with the first question from uh, uh, Godless. Godless, are you there? Yeah. Uh, I just had to make a, uh, a few brief comments quick to get to my questions. So, David, I was like, I came into the atheist movement. I was so into it, so passionate. Uh, right around the reason, the first reason rally, I remember watching the videos. I watched your speech over and over again. It was so inspiring. I would get tears in my eyes. That's how passionate I was about the 80s movement when I first came around. And then, but I never fell for any of the garbage, the third wave feminist garbage, like all the way going back to Elevator Gate. I was like opposed to this. And I watched the atheist movement. I watched it very closely. Um, go to turn to shit. And you, like, were one of the big factors in that. And I remember watching the second Reason rally. Uh, I had planned to go and didn't end up going, but I was watching from your speech from the live stream. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm so glad I didn't go. Like, just in those those few years in between the two rallies, it, the, the movement had turned to crap. And um, it's just become, like, a total joke to me now. So my question is... And I think this is a unique point that I haven't, I've been like watching all the videos on this, on your uh, false allegations. I haven't seen anybody bring this up to you. And it's probably gonna make you defensive, but um, I want you to know I have a lot, like when you talk about your life being ruined, I have a lot of compassion for you. It's, it's absolutely horrible and you do not deserve it. But my question is who deserves it more? It's kind of like justice served, and it's funny in a way. Who deserves it more than people like you and Richard Carrier, who were leaders of the atheist movement, who helped po third wave feminism poison the movement? Now, believe me, um, I, I, I first of all, Godless, thank you for coming to the the. Thank you for watching the videos, and thank you for that. And um, I, you know, I was inside it for a while, and I've said it many times before, but. Wokeism, the social justice 
it's it's very very religiony, and it snuck up on me. I went from being a big tent atheist to being a big tent but no Nazi atheist to being um, somebody who really uh, who who was really a believer in Me Too and a really an assurer of due process. And I don't think it's funny. I think it is ironic that it bit me. I think it's also predictable that it bit me. Um, I hope uh, people don't find comedy in it because it was extraordinarily painful, the kind of pain I would never wish on anybody. But yeah, you know, I, I, I am appreciative of the fact that I helped this come in. Um, one of the things that uh, Kathleen and I, Kathleen mentioned uh, Johnny Depp, and you mentioned the Second Reason Rally. Well, Johnny Depp was going to come to the Second Reason Rally. And he was going to speak at the Second Reason Rally, and then Amber made her accusations, and I was part of the team that pushed Johnny Depp away because of the allegations alone. I did that. I did that. And I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing the good thing. And should I stop talking? No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, you can go as long as you want. It's your segment. Okay, so I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing a good thing. And... It really didn't, it really, you know, because I, so I have, we have to be compassionate about people who are in this because a lot of people, I didn't realize I was in it when I was in it. And I didn't realize I was in it really until after I pushed out, you know, after my, after the whole thing exploded and after I, I, I went through this, I actually felt, you know, ownership of the crime of doing uh, what I had done. Um, and I felt myself, you know, it was reasonable for me to have be collateral damage because I still stuck by the Me Too movement, even as the Me Too movement had chewed me up and spit me out ir- wrongly, and I still stuck by them. And, and somebody once said to me, uh, my, my good friend Andrew once said to me, that it was like, um, that I was like a, uh, a raped choir boy who still defended the church. And that was kind of like this aha moment for me where I realized, holy crap, this is a religion. Wokeism is a religion. I'm believing mantras. I'm believing things based on no data. I'm believing mantras because people are telling me to believe mantras. I'm saying things because people are telling me to say things. And I'm living under a threat that if I don't say things, then I'll be ousted. And this was after I was ousted. And so my answer to you, Godless, is that um, the, the fact that I was in it puts me in touch with the fact that there are millions and millions of people who are in it right now who think they're doing good, just like the, um, the, uh, the Islamic uh, terrorists walking down the streets of Paris uh, shooting children, just like the Muslims flying the planes into the World Trade Center. They think they're doing good when they're destroying lives. And that, you know, it's, it's something that they really, we really need to have compassion for uh, because this stuff is insidious and it's threatening and it's scary. And, you know, I was in it for a while and I was in it even after it chewed me and spit me out. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be out of it now, but yeah, I get the irony and uh, I feel bad for every piece of that, that I had to do with it. Um, thank you so much, David. Once again, reminder for both of you, if there is a question or line of inquiry that makes you feel uncomfortable, simply say it. You do not have to answer all questions. Our next question is for Kathleen from Eureka. Do you live in the South or the North? Oh, I live in the South. Um, I grew up in the South as South can get. Um, oh, I live in the Bible. All right. Next person who wants to ask questions is an uh, internet uh, personality by the name of Darth Dawkins. Uh, I believe the question is for Mr. Silverman. Uh, Darth, are you there? You will be unmuted now. Yeah, I'm here. All right, Darth, the floor is yours. David, if there is anything that makes you uncomfortable about the line of questioning, please say the word. We will move on immediately. Go ahead, Hi. Darth, the floor is yours. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Um, David, since your worldview, you're without reference to God as the ultimate nature of reality, what is the ultimate nature of reality that will allow you a frame of reference to make sense of any facts that you speak? So when you're dealing with morality and when you're dealing with um, frames outside of the spirit, so, so you have to understand 
that from an atheist perspective, I'm going to do the same thing that you do. Okay. You have your perspective, which you also get strictly within the natural realm. You get your perspective from your preachers, your books, you get that from that. Um, and that is a natural thing. It's not actually supernaturally based. You think it is, and you give that credit for it, but it's not real. So I get my stuff the same place that I get from you. But what's not real? The God isn't real, but the book, okay. but the book is how did right? you How did you determine that? Are we having a God discussion? Are we having a God debate? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm I mean, maybe, if you know. the, the reason that I don't believe in God is because the sum total of scientifically valid evidence for anything supernatural ever in the history of the world is zero. Um, and the other side of it is that uh, every single argument for the existence of God, of any God, um, be it the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, uh, or, or even... Um, the argument for morality, uh, they are all just God of the gaps, and they can be used to defend any deity. So in a sense, the short answer is uh, I don't believe in any gods because they all have exactly the same evidence as each other, and that all that evidence combined is zero. But that's not the real question that you asked. The real question that you asked is how do I have a moral framework for that? The moral framework comes from the idea that, uh, you know, Sam Harris writes in uh, End of Faith about um, he posits an objective morality. I didn't ask you about moral. I didn't ask you about morals. Okay, I ask you, you more with that. I yeah, I, yeah. You answered questions that I didn't ask. Okay, I ask you that since you reject and are without God as what would be ultimate in reality, I ask you what is the ultimate nature of reality as a frame of reference that will allow you to make sense of any fact that. You the nature of reality yeah since you since you deny the existence of god then you must have my something else in mind that it, uh, my my object my the, the nature of reality for me is the same as whether or not i believe in any deity your god or anybody else's god the answer is quite simple i don't know i don't okay, know so, the so then so, so, you, so you have no ultimate foundation to speak facts Yes, I do have everything that we have observed to be. No, I said, do you have an ultimate yeah. foundation by which you can ground facts? I have the exact same foundation that you do. The only difference is that you pretend that yours is supernatural and I don't. No, I ask you, do you have an ultimate foundation as a frame of reference to place facts? I don't even know what that means. Okay. Do I well, have an ultimate well, foundation? In, Look, in, we, are all, we are all perceiving this universe in, together. Yeah. And we are all perceiving things to, to a certain level of knowledge and a certain level of comfort. I know. I don't think you're understanding. I don't think you're understanding the question. Why are we doing this now? It, it, Dave, Dave, just, Dave, come on. Just, just, just a second. Dave, are you comfortable continuing this inquiry or would you prefer to move on? Oh, I'm not here to debate the existence of God. I've done that so many times and I'm not really interested in doing right now. But uh, and. You, but I'm happy to talk to it. Yes. I mean, if he's telling, he's telling yeah, as you me. wish, as, as you wish, Dave. Do you want me to let him continue this inquiry? Whenever you want, we want to make you as comfortable as possible. Do you want me to unmute him? No, continue. But please, okay. but but please, um, let's 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 get into you know what something useful is. Let's talk about something useful here. I mean, if if we're talking about uh, you know the reference, yes, of course, everything is relative. If you don't have uh, if you don't have an objective knowledge of the universe, and neither you nor I do, then everything is relative and everything we observe is relative. That doesn't mean it's not relative to a certain point that we can call it comfortably certain. We are comfortably certain of reality. We have a framework of reality that we operate in, and we operate, you and I, operate in the exact same reality. And we operate in the exact same filters. The only difference is that you're just attributing, um, you're just attributing credit that I'm not. And so that's kind of the only, that, that's, that's the only real answer to your question. You and I have the same framework. Okay. The only difference is that you have this other framework, this super framework that you've, that your, your religion has kind of invented and say, ha, ah, this, this you tells know, you what you're we're not, you're on. not addressing. You're not. Why do you, why do you keep on muting me Canadian?
Uh, Dave, it's a, it's a, it's your call at this point. Do you prefer to continue this, or should we move on to the next question? Oh, we can keep going. We can end all this right. and move. All, all right. Um, we will uh, we will be moving on to the next question, Real which quick, is Canadian. Real quick, Canadian. I just want to ask Dave a question. When you said um, um, comfortably relative, uh, I'm curious if that was a uh, 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 an imposition towards comfortably numb. If that was a what? Uh, yeah, never mind. It was a joke. Yeah, he made a joke. So we're moving on to the next question. And that's where the recording that I have ends. So that's where we have to end this video. But I would like to thank everybody who participated in the event, uh, especially Kathleen Tanner, who was such a good uh, interlocutor. And uh, I want to, you know, send out an open invitation to any progressives out there who want to debate me on any show, civil discourse. Let's talk about it. I'm open to change. If I'm wrong, if you are too, you should be. Let's talk. Let's have a civil dialogue. Let's discuss ideas. Even if they just, even if we're disagreeing on them, um, I want to um, thank everybody and thank you for watching. Click like, subscribe, and subscribe star, please, so that because this is help. You know, it's one of the ways I make a living these days. And I want to thank you all uh, for watching the video. Spread it around. Spread the love. Stay safe. See you soon.